Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. The quality and the efficacy is all equal. The one remaining variable is the cost. And I think now that you're seeing more and more products getting FDA approval, you're going to see much more pressure for these products to come on the market. Welcome to Breaking Down Biosimilars, a podcast that brings light to biosimilars and helps you better understand the role they play in your healthcare now and in the future. I'm Zoe Rothblatt. And I'm Connor Mertens. Both of us are patient advocates and community outreach managers at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. During the series, we cover everything you need to know about biosimilars, what they are, how they work, and who should take them. We also hear from a few people who've been taking biosimilars about their own experiences. And we cover some of the common myths about biosimilars and try to separate fact from fiction. So Connor, based on what we've learned so far, I think it's safe to say that the U.S. rollout of biosimilars over the last six years has been kind of rocky, to say the least. Oh, totally. And in our previous episodes, we talked about some of those reasons for why that is happening, one being the issue of all those cost savings we were supposed to see. But those really haven't materialized yet, have they? Certainly not to any large degree. And you'd think that they would, considering that biosimilars are less expensive to the manufacturer. And the process of getting them approved with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is also a bit less rigorous than for biologics. Yeah, I mean, on the surface, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We looked at other complicating factors like rebate walls, the role of pharmacy benefit managers, and how insurance coverage can be unpredictable and arbitrary when it comes to biosimilars. And there's still the uphill battle against all of the misinformation that's out there. Right. Like biosimilars don't work. They won't be any less expensive. They'll cause serious side effects, you know, all these things. So kind of a rough start all around. But Connor, fear not. There are a few things to cheer about looking down the road. Yes, you know, at this point, I could use a little cheering up. The first thing is that starting in 2023, you're going to see a bunch of new biosimilars coming onto the market. And hopefully that will begin to spur more competition. And you're going to have to pardon me here being the eternal optimist, but that should lead to lower prices. It definitely should. These new medications have already been approved by the FDA. They include six new biosimilars for the biologic known as Humira by six different manufacturers, no less. These biosimilars will treat a range of conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and others. What's more is that two other new biosimilars are also on the way, and they're for the drug called Embril, but those are still a few years away. So definitely some good news, but I'm curious about what the medical professionals say, whether they share my eternal optimism. I think they do. We've heard a lot during this podcast series from Dr. Simon Helfgott. He's the Director of Education and Fellowship Training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Hopgott says that right now we're at a crossroad. I think what we're seeing now is a critical mass. And I think that in the next three to five years, we're going to see a deluge because all the self-injectable drugs that are kind of waiting to come on the market will finally be able to do that because some of the patents of some of the popular biological drugs are coming off patent in the next 12 to 18 months. So I think it's just sheer number of biosimilars will get everybody across and break that barrier. According to Dr. Helfgott, pricing is still a major issue, but one that can be overcome. I think if we can figure out a way to moderate the cost of these drugs while providing access to the drugs, and also hopefully with biosimilars, insurance companies perhaps may not be as rigid denying patients the way they sometimes do. Most legitimate large insurance companies have policies in place to allow our patients access to these drugs. But I can tell you from experience, since so many of our diseases are orphan diseases, there really may not be any FDA guidance for the use of biologics in some conditions, and we can have a tough time getting approval. But my hope is that with biosimilars keeping the cost down, we might be able to bend attitudes at the insurance companies and Perhaps in the next couple of years, we'll see some loosening in terms of criteria for us to access it in those situations where it's been a challenge to get these drugs. Another doctor we've heard on breaking down biosimilars is Robert Popovian, a colleague of ours who's chief science policy officer here at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. 
He shares Dr. Halfgott's enthusiasm about the upcoming release of the new biosimilars. I think it's going to be better for access because we've seen that whenever biosimilars are introduced, the utilization actually went up. So it was basically patients who were not getting the biologic because of cost reasons that had more access to it. I think what you're going to see in the U.S. market is perhaps adoption of biologics earlier on in the disease process rather than having to go through other alternatives if the prices keep coming down because no longer they're going to be blocked by these prioritizations and all these other things, which is also important because we know that earlier you treat the disease more aggressively with therapies, the long-term patients do better. There's less sensibility, especially in autoimmune disorders. I think we have a great opportunity here in the U.S. market to really lower prices for everyone. So even as medical professionals are applauding the expanded choices that are going to soon be available, patients like Laura McClinton from Canada say they're already seeing the benefits. Having more treatment options, of course, has been a massively helpful and encouraging thing. It's really, really nice to be able to look at all of the possible medication options that exist so that I know that if things with the current biosimilar that I'm taking ever don't work out or it turns out it's not right for me, I know that there are many, many options. I think it's really, really amazing to have so many different treatment options, especially treatment options that are more accessible financially to everybody. Thanks for listening to Breaking Down Biosimilars, a podcast that sheds light on biosimilars and helps you better understand the role they play in your healthcare, now and in the future. We hope you learned something useful in this episode as we've looked ahead to what the future holds. And as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts about how the market for biosimilars may improve in the months and years ahead. Send us an email at breakingdownbiosimilars at ghlf.org. And if you liked this episode, give us a rating and write a review at Apple Podcasts. It'll help people like you find people like us. I'm Connor Mertens. And I'm Zoe Rothblatt. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Thank you.